Good morning. Welcome to Sunday service. Let's begin with the collect. As we gather, may your spirit be within us. As we gather, may we glorify you. Knowing well that as our hearts begin to worship, we'll be blessed because we came. We'll be blessed because we came. Today's call to worship is taken from Psalm chapter 104, verses 1 to 4. Psalm 104. Praise the Lord, O my soul. O Lord my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty. He wraps himself in light as with a garment. He stretches out the heavens like a tent and lays the beams of his upper chambers on their waters. He makes the clouds his chariot and rides on the wings of the wind. He makes winds his messengers, flames of fire his servants. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you that we've come and that you've gathered us together so that we can worship you and learn more from your word, God. Thank you that we can be together today in your presence. Um, help us to be ready to be attentive to what you're teaching to us today. And yeah, thank you that you love us so much and help us to love you more of each day. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please rise so we can worship our Lord. Light of the world. Light of the world, you step down into dark. Oh. 
to me. to live within your love, be undone by who you are. My desire is to know you deeper. Lord, I will open up again, throw my fears into the wind. I am desperate for a touch of heaven. In your love and affection, it's the sweetest of all. And Lord, I know my heart wants more of you. My heart wants something new, so I surrender all. All I want is to live within your love, be undone by who. My desire is to know you deeper, Lord, I will open up again, throw my fears into the wind, I am desperate for a touch of heaven, oh, have your way in me now. I open up my heart to you. I open up my heart to you now to do what only you can. Jesus, have your
Constitution Speaker. And let's pray together. Lord, we gather here as your children. We pray to you. We know that you are with us, not just today, but throughout the week. In the past week, in our own vocation, career, in our own schools, homes, neighborhoods, whatever we have experienced, we know that we can trust in you. For the burdens we are carrying even at this moment, for the challenges and problems we still need to find solutions to solve, for those emotions ups and downs, and even for sometimes for a struggle, Lord, we give thanks to you, for we know that even before we find all these solutions, you are with us. And we give thanks for as we open up ourselves to you, you will touch us in special ways. So at this moment, on this Sunday morning, we gather, we praise you, we draw near to you, we come before you and we confess our sins before you. Lord, thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your love. And thank you for this community that you have prepared for us. Not just we meet on Sunday, but we connect with one another in different ways. We know that we have brothers and sisters. We have friends that we can grow together. We pray not just for the English congregation. We pray for the Mandarin, for the Cantonese, for our children. As we noticed recently, a lot of people are getting sick because of flu, because of different weather changes, or temperature changes, we pray for them. We pray for those who are sick, we pray for those who are having challenging times in school or at work. We pray for those family members um, who are sick. We, we pray for those who are caregivers, who need to care for their own family members, no matter if they're children, if they're own family members, or even elderly friends, parents, we pray for these caregivers. And we, Lord, we pray for the community. We give thanks for we can participate in Shoebox every year. We're supporting the Church of St. Jude. We give thanks and we pray that we will continue to support this meaningful ministry so that people in this area, this local area, can be touched. And we pray for the city, for the province, and for our nation. Today we pray for our pastor, Pastor Felix and his family as they are on vacation. May you be with them, take them to whatever experience that you prepare for them, and may they, be, may they be refreshed in you. And today as we gather, Lord, we pray for those people who are in our hearts, that we care for them, our friends, our colleagues. We pray for them too. Lord, may we be a people of blessing. May we be your channel of your peace. We just passed Remembrance Day. We pray for the all people all over the world, in Ukraine, in Russia, in different parts of Europe, in Middle East, in other continents, in other cities. We pray for those people who are struggling. At this moment, we pray also, Lord, for those who are rulers, governors, governments all over the world. We pray because we know that they are all under you. You are the Lord who is reigning over all. Lord, at this moment, we, as we gather, as we are preparing ourselves to continue to sing and continue to worship you and listen to your word, we pray that we will enjoy this moment, not just the worship, but we know that we are being sent forth by you to enter a new week of responsibilities and challenges. We know that you are with us. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be together today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Father in heaven, Father in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
each moment all that we need forgive us our sins as we forgive the ones who have sinned against us oh our father in heaven lead us not and lead us not into temptation God deliver us from the enemy yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever yours is the Father, our Father, have your way on the earth, your will be done. Our Father, have your way on the earth, your will be done. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory Today's scripture reading is taken from Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 to 15. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have re received their award in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father, who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This is then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgave men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. This is God's word.
A warm welcome to everyone joining our worship, but a special welcome to our guest speaker, Reverend Dr. James Petler today. Reverend Petler is the Bastion Chair of Wesley Studies and Associate Professor of Theology at Tyndale Seminary in Toronto. And he's an ordained minister of the Free Methodist Church in Canada. And also he leads worship ministry at our Leah by Wesley Chapel at Warden and Huntingwood in Scarborough area. So today we are very thankful to have Dr. Petler with us and speaking to us about the perfect prayer. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning. It's good to be here. I have preached here before for this congregation, but it's been several years. I don't know if any of you remember, but it's good to be back. And um, about six years ago, our church uh, was under renovations, and we used to rent space from this church. We were here every Sunday for almost a year in the afternoon. So this place was our second home. It still feels like home for us. And uh, we had a lot of good memories, especially because of the, the wonderful people that are here. You were so kind and welcoming to us while we were here. And whenever we drive by on the highway, my, my daughter, one, I have a daughter who's almost eight. She was here. She was like two. And she always remembers, oh, there's the old church that we used to go to. So it's, uh, it's good to be here with you today back at this, in this congregation. <clears throat> so the topic today is the Lord's Prayer. And we all know that there's some Christians who are what we call prayer warriors, right? People who are just uh, really gifted in prayer. And for prayer comes really easily to them. And you probably know some people like that. But the truth is, of course, not all of us are prayer warriors. Uh, most of us, if we're honest, would probably say we wish we prayed more. We feel like we should pray more. Uh, most of us, if we were honest, we would say we don't always know how to pray, or we don't always know what to pray. Um, whether you're a new Christian or you've been a Christian for many years, we all have, uh, we can all grow in our prayer life. But thankfully, Jesus has given us this prayer, the Lord's Prayer. And we, we just had it uh, read for us. Thank you. And it's um, a prayer that you pray every Sunday here in your church services. A lot of Christians pray it at home as well every day. And that's a tradition that goes back all the way to the first century. In fact, one of the oldest Christian documents we have after the New Testament is a document called the Didache, which means the teaching. And it's almost as old as the New Testament itself. And in that uh, text, it says, it instructed the Christians to pray the Lord's Prayer three times a day. And many people did that for many centuries and still do. So it's a very familiar prayer. We all know the Lord's Prayer um, and uh, you mob, if you grew up in the church, you probably learned it as a child. It's probably one of the first prayers you learned. But that doesn't mean it's a childish prayer. It's a perfect prayer, the Lord's Prayer. It's a perfect prayer, and it's perfect for several reasons. First of all, it's perfect because it's taught by God himself. This is a prayer that Jesus passed on to us, to the disciples, as a model for our prayer. Not that it's the only prayer you can say, but it's a, it's a good prayer. It's a perfect prayer from Jesus himself. And when he taught it, he did say very explicitly, this then is how you should pray. And secondly, it's a perfect prayer because it contains all other prayers. Any God-honoring prayer that you want to say is included or implied in the phrases that you find in the Lord's Prayer. Uh, John Wesley said of the Lord's Prayer, he said, it contains all we can reasonably or innocently pray for and all that we can reasonably or innocently desire. And he said, our prayers are the test of our desires. If you have a desire and it's not something you feel that you could pray for, then that's probably a sign that it's not a God-honoring desire. So the Lord's Prayer contains it all, as we will see. And thirdly, it's a perfect prayer because it's a prayer for all Christians. Everyone can pray this prayer. And when you pray this prayer, you're joining with Christians all around the world who are also praying this prayer. So let's explore the prayer a little bit. We're going to go through it phrase by phrase. And it starts with an introduction. And then there are six petitions or six requests of God. And then the doxology. So the introductory sentence is, Our Father in heaven, right? our Father in heaven. 
Now, this is where we name the God that we're going to pray to. Because it's essential that you're praying to the true God. It's no good to pray to a false God. It's no good to pray to a God that doesn't exist. We're praying when we pray, Our Father, we're praying to the God of the Gospel, the God of the Bible, the God that's revealed through the life and ministry and saving work of Jesus Christ. This God is our deliverer. Jesus, the Son of God, came from the Father, and he teaches us that we should call God our Father. Now, in the Old Testament... Uh, Israel was sometimes called God's son. Not all the time, but especially when they needed deliverance. So God told uh, Pharaoh, Moses, when he went to see Pharaoh, he said, you tell Pharaoh, Israel is my firstborn son. Let my son go so that he may worship me. You may remember also in Hosea 6, God says, out of Egypt I called my son. And he's talking about Israel, his, whole, his people. And he had that father-like relationship with them where when they were enslaved in the land of Egypt, he was like a, a father who wanted to rescue his child. And a father would do anything to rescue their child when they are in danger. That's the kind of father we have. He also was called the father to David, King David, the great king of the Old Testament. And in 2 Samuel chapter 7, God made a great promise to David. And he said he was gonna, his throne was going to be established forever. And he said, I'm going to be like a father to you, and you will be like a son to me. So there was a special relationship with the king. But of course, all that is fulfilled in Jesus. Jesus is the true Israel and the true King David, the Messiah who came to establish that kingdom forever. And not only that, but he came to welcome us into the kingdom and to make us his brothers and sisters in God's family. So when we pray, our Father, you know, it's a simple thing to say. It's a simple way to begin the prayer. We're, we're assuming the posture of children before the Lord. But it's also got the whole gospel story behind it. That God the Father sent God the Son to die and rise again so that all who believe in him would be born again by the Holy Spirit and welcomed into God's family and adopted as sons and daughters of God, co-heirs with Christ. So when we pray to our Father, right, this is not a vague God that we're praying to. This is, this is not an unknown God. This is a God we know through Jesus. We know his character. We know his heart. We know that he is an all-loving Father who, as Jesus says, in this passage, already knows what we need even before we ask for it. I have a two-year-old daughter at home. And, you know, whenever she gets really cranky and she's getting upset about everything and she won't eat her supper, I know it's probably because she's overtired and she needs to go to bed. But if I say to her, Sadie, you're tired, you need to go to bed. What do you think she will say? No, I'm not going to bed. Right? But I know I'm her father. I know what she needs. Even when she doesn't understand and she can't ask for what she needs, I know. And that's what our Heavenly Father is like. That's the kind of father we're approaching. A father who already knows what's best for us and what we need. So when we pray to our Father, we're speaking as members of a family. It's a relationship of love. And now we have the first petition, or the first thing we ask of God. And it is, hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. And the word hallowed means to consecrate or to make something holy. But of course, God is already holy. He doesn't need us to make him holy. He's the one who makes us holy. He's the holy, holy, holy one of Isaiah chapter 6. He's the, he's the one who hallowed the Sabbath day. He's the one who made the ground around the burning bush holy ground when he was there with his presence, right? This is the God that we serve. He's already holy. We don't need to make him holy. We're not praying that God would become holy. We're praying that God's name would be treated as holy. That God's name would be honored. 
for the name that it is. Now, in English Canadian culture, um, when people name their children, for example, there's usually not a, a big meaning behind the name. Often it's just, we like the sound of the name, so we give the child the name we like. But in the Bible, names often have a lot of significance. Uh, take the name of Jacob in Genesis. He was born and he was a twin. And the story is that when he was born, his brother Esau came out first. He was born first, but Jacob was grabbing at his heel. And the name Jacob actually means something like heel grabber. But what is a heel grabber? Well, it means a trickster. Jacob's name means trickster. And the name reveals his character. Jacob was a trickster. Because later when he grew up, he tricked his father Isaac into giving him his older brother's inheritance and his blessing. He dressed up in, you know, Esau was a very hairy guy, and, and Jacob was very uh, smooth skinned, and he dressed up in, in animal skins and tricked his father. And anyway, you know the story probably. And so he was, this, he was a trickster. But then only after he'd been gone a long time, he had to run away because his brother got so mad he was going to kill him. He ran away and he had to live uh, with his uncle Laban for 14 years and uh, where he got tricked by his uncle. That's a whole other story. But only after he learned a lot of hard lessons, he was coming back home to see his family and he meets God and he wrestles with the angel. Remember that strange story? And he's wrestling with the angel. And then what happens at the end of that story, he gets a new name. His name is Israel. Israel means struggles with God or wrestles with God. So his name meant a lot. Names can have great significance, and it's no less with the name of the Lord. Proverbs 22 verse 1 says, A good name is more desirable than great riches. And we all know what that means, right? To have a good name is to have a good reputation. It means you're respected, you're trusted as a person of character. And this extends to families. If you're born into a well-respected family, then that means you've been given a good name. You have your family name that you take with you. And, and, and if a member of the family is like a black sheep and they do things that are embarrassing to the family, then we say they're bringing the family name dishonor. They're dishonoring the family name, right? Now, we are part of God's family. We call him our father, right? We're in his family. And we've been given a good name by being a part of that family. And we want that good name to be honored. We pray it for the whole world. We want everyone to come to know and love and honor the Lord. But we're also, of course, praying it for ourselves. And saying, Lord, help us to live in a way that honors your name. That your name would be hallowed. The second petition is your kingdom come. Your kingdom come. When Jesus began his ministry, he was talking about the kingdom. He came preaching, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. <clears throat> In another place, he says, the kingdom is among you. Right, The kingdom of God is among you. So in some sense, it was coming. In another sense, it was already there. And yet, he also taught his disciples and us to pray, your kingdom come. So how can the kingdom be among us and we're still being taught to pray for it to come? Well, the kingdom is not a physical space. It's not a geographical territory. It is present wherever God's reign is established and honored. So when we enter God's family, when we put our faith in Jesus and we call God our Father... We're also joining a kingdom. We're born again by the Holy Spirit, and the kingdom is set up in our own heart. What does that mean? It means God rules there. God's reign is set up in our own heart. And now we live according to the law of the kingdom, the law of love, love for God and love for our neighbor. And we see the fruit of the Spirit growing up inside of us and producing all sorts of good works. And these are signs that the kingdom of heaven is among us and within us. But look around. 
in the world today, right? The kingdom of, is the kingdom of God here? Is the kingdom of God here all in, in the world that we live in? Of course not. It's not here completely. The world has not submitted to God's reign. The world has not submitted to God's rule. The world is in rebellion. And even in our own hearts, we still struggle with being part of the kingdom and sometimes that spirit of rebellion that rears its ugly head. And the rebellion produces not the fruit of the spirit, but what Paul calls uh, the works of the flesh. Immorality, impurity, hatred, jealousy, envy, strife, and so forth. All of these works of the flesh, they produce pain, they produce suffering. And we see that our world is not right. Everything is not right in the world. And so when we come to God, our Father, we pray, Thy kingdom come, your kingdom come. We're saying, we're bringing all that pain. We're bringing all the suffering, all the disorder, all the rebellion that we see in the world around us. We bring that before God in prayer and we say, Lord, your kingdom come. We want that to end. We want this world to be brought into your kingdom, your just and, and uh, loving and merciful kingdom where all things are set right. We want the wars to stop. We want uh, corruption to stop. We want oppression to stop. We want your righteous reign to be established. And we pray with confidence, despite all the discouraging things we might see in the world today, we have confidence because we know that God has promised that his kingdom will come. That one day, completely and fully, the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. And that's our hope. That's our future. And that's God's promise to us. So we know that that's coming. But while we wait for it, we pray. Your kingdom come. The third petition is, your will be done on earth as in heaven. And in a way, this is just a more specific way of saying your, your kingdom come. What does it mean for the kingdom to come? It means God's will is being done. In all things. In the here and now. On earth. And as it is in heaven, how is God's will done in heaven? It's done perfectly. It's done completely. And that's what we want, but we're bringing it down more to a personal level here. So we pray for the world that God's will would be done everywhere, but we pray for ourselves that God's will would be done in our own life. And there's two sides to this prayer for ourselves. On the one hand, there's a passive side, and that is that we submit to God's will. When we submit to God's will, we're saying, God, whatever your will is, I accept it. I will submit to it. Uh, whatever you bring to pass in my life, even if I don't necessarily in the moment think it's good or understand what you're doing, I accept your will and your reign. But just as we submit passively, we also commit actively to doing God's will. If we are going to pray, your will be done, we have to be ready to do God's will. We have to be ready to obey so we, ha we are asking God for the grace to obey because we all need God's grace and power in order to obey his will, especially when it's challenging. And our model for this prayer, of course, is Jesus himself. You remember on the night that he was betrayed, when he was going to the cross, he went and he prayed. He went to the Garden of Gethsemane and he was struggling. And this is the moment in Jesus' life where we see his real humanity as clear as, as anywhere else. Because he, he knows what's coming. He knows he's going to the cross. He knows about the betrayal. He knows about the su physical suffering he's going to endure. And he's struggling with that. And he brings it before his father. And he says, Lord, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Basically, he's saying, if there's any way out of this, <laughs> let it happen. But then he says... But not my will, but thine be done. Not my will, but yours be done. And that's what we're praying here too. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. For me, that means not my will, but yours be done. Now the fourth petition is more directly focused on our own needs. Give us today our daily bread. Of course, daily bread 
isn't just about food, right? It's about the necessities of life, the things that we all need to survive. We bring those before the Lord and ask him to provide. And here in Canada, we live in a, a country of great prosperity and abundance. And most of us don't have to worry a whole lot about where our next meal is coming from, thankfully. Although there are people, of course, here in our own community who do have to worry about that. But we can sometimes lose touch with the fact that we are needy people. We need basic things every single day of our life to survive. And we need to trust God as our provider to bring us what we need. Of course, the background of this prayer is also in the Old Testament. And a Jew could not pray this prayer and hear this prayer without thinking of the story of the manna in the wilderness. You remember after the people of Israel were rescued from slavery and they crossed the Red Sea and then they got out into the desert and then they start to complain because they didn't have any food. And they said, Moses, why did you bring us out here to die in the desert? At least we had food back in Egypt. But God heard their complaining. And what did he do? He sent them this miraculous bread, the manna that came down from heaven. And every morning they woke up and they could go out and just collect that manna. But they could only collect what they needed for that day. They were instructed, do not collect more than you need for that day. Why? So that they would trust. They would have to trust God that he was going to provide again the next day. And if they tried to collect extra, it would go rotten. And they wouldn't be able to eat it. Now in Deuteronomy chapter 8, Moses explains the meaning of the, the manna. And he said to the people of Israel, God humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna to teach you. That man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. <clears throat> now, I hope we are never stuck in a desert without food. I don't want to know what that would be like. But we have the story of the Israelites to teach us the lesson of the manna. We don't live by bread alone. We live by God's word. But also, the other lesson of it is that even the bread we have, it ultimately comes from God. Because God is the creator of heaven and earth and everything in it. It doesn't matter if you bought something with your own money, so to speak. If God had not created it, it wouldn't be there. If God had not created you, you wouldn't be here. Everything we have is a gift. And so we ask God every day, give us this day our daily bread. Because it builds in us a gratitude. For those gifts. And Jesus referred to this teaching in several other places in his own life when he was tempted in the wilderness. You may recall, he said to the devil in his response, Man does not live on bread alone. And also in this same chapter, in Matthew chapter 6, he teaches the disciples, Don't worry about tomorrow, right? Each day has enough worry of its own. Trust with what God has given you for today. So there's a lot of meaning behind this prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. God gives us many blessings. We can't take them for granted. Now, if someone comes to your house as a guest and they just get up and walk into the kitchen and grab a glass and pour themselves a drink and start drinking without asking for it, how would you feel? Well, it's not that you don't... You, you'd be happy to give them a drink, of course, but, but it's uh, rude and... and uh, presumptuous of them to just go and take it without asking because it's your house it's your kitchen right it's your drink the same with god yes even if we have everything we need it's presumptuous not to thank god for all the good things we have and recognize that they are gifts from god our father the fifth petition forgive our sins as we forgive those who sin against us so just as we confess our dependence on God for our necessities of life, we confess our dependence on God for forgiveness. And no one's ever beyond praying this prayer. Doesn't matter how old you are, doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian, even if you're the holiest Christian on earth, you can still pray every day, forgive us our sins uh, as we forgive those who sinned against us. And we ask God our Father for forgiveness because only God can forgive sins 
This is one of those verses that's translated differently in different translations. The, the traditional English prayer is forgive us our trespasses from the King James. And the one that you say is forgive us our sins. But some other translations say forgive us our debts. I think that was the, the scripture reading today was the debts version, right? And that's one of the best ways to think about sin. Sin leaves us with a debt that we cannot pay. But thanks be to God, Jesus has paid it all. God sent his son to earth to become human for us because it was only fitting that a human should pay the debt for human sin. <clears throat> but on the other hand, the debt was so great that no regular human being could pay the debt. Only a human should pay it, but only God could pay it. And so God became human. God sent God the Son was sent to become one of us so that he could erase that debt of sin. So we pray, pray, forgive us our sins. We can pray that with confidence because we know the debt has been paid for. If we confess our sins, he will forgive our sins no matter what we've done. God's grace is always greater than our sin. But we need to ask for forgiveness just like we would always ask for a drink at our friend's house, we wouldn't just waltz in and open their fridge and take something. We don't want to presume on God's grace either. Asking forgiveness is important because it keeps us humble. It reminds us that we are sinners. But it also keeps us grateful because we know God's mercy is so great and wonderful. But we can't forget the second part of this prayer Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. If God can forgive our sins so generously, so freely, then we ought to do the same for others who have sinned against us. And Jesus told a parable in Matthew chapter 18 that illustrates this truth. We call it the parable of the unforgiving servant. And Jesus tells the story that a uh, um, a, uh, a servant was brought in before his master in order to pay his debt. And the debt was 10,000 talents, which is something like millions of dollars, okay, in today's money. He had to pay millions of dollars, but he couldn't pay it. And so the master said, well, I'm going to sell your wife and your children and all your possessions so that I can at least get some of the money back. And the man begged his master. He said, no, please, just be patient. I will pay it back. I promise you, don't sell my wife and children. I can't bear that. And the master felt pity. And he felt sorry for the man. And he said, well, I actually, you know what? I feel bad. I shouldn't have done I'm going to forgive the entire thing. He let him go. No debt. Erased. And then that servant went out and he saw his friend, another servant, who owed him like $5. And he said, hey, give me my money back. And the other servant said, oh, I'm sorry, I don't have it. I can't pay it right now. Uh, please be patient with me. Just the same thing he said. He said, no, forget it. I'm throwing you in jail until you can be tortured and pay me back my money. And then the master heard about it. <laughs> and he was no longer merciful on that first servant. He had him thrown in jail. But when we understand the depths of God's love and mercy and what he has done for us in Jesus, we can't help but be merciful to others. It's not always easy. But that's why we pray it every day. Forgive us our sins as we forgive others. We're praying for grace for ourselves and grace to forgive others as well as we've been forgiven. And now the sixth and the final petition is... Uh, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, this is another verse that gets, you can tell it's a tricky one because it's translated differently in different uh, Bibles. Now, the one <coughs> on your bulletin here is save us from the time of trial. And that is one way to interpret it. I think in the scripture reading it said, uh, lead us not into temptation. Um, the Greek word for temptation here can be translated as trial or test. 
And people are confused, though, when you, especially when it is, God, lead us not into temptation, because they say, well, God, what, would God really tempt us? Is that what it's saying? Why do we have to ask God not to lead us to temptation? Well, God doesn't tempt us. He allows us to be tested, though. And sometimes those tests might involve temptations. If we were never tempted, uh, we would never learn to resist temptation. But God himself does not test us. James chapter 1, verse 13 says that very clearly. It says, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But we pray this prayer every day because... We recognize the world is full of temptations. The world is full of trials. The world is full of tests. And we need God's help every day. And it's a good reminder to remember that as we go out into the day, we're going to need God's help. We're going to need God's protection. I know I have a weakness for chocolate-covered almonds. You know, and I know if there's chocolate-covered almonds in the house, I just cannot stop myself from eating them. And during the lockdowns, my wife used to go to Costco, and she would buy the big bags. They were like one-kilogram bags of chocolate-covered almonds and put them in the cupboard, and that was great. I loved it, and I would go, and I was eating them all the time. And then after a while, I had to say to her, look, just don't buy any more chocolate-covered almonds. I can't stop. I was putting on weight from all the chocolate-covered almonds I was eating. Of course, we all needed comfort food when we were in lockdowns, right? So I, I, I couldn't stop myself. I knew I needed protection from that. And so we can pray to the Lord. Look, Lord, protect us. We know we're weak. We know we need God's help. We don't want to be exposed into dangerous situations. Uh, though when we are, we pray, God, deliver us from evil. God, provide a way out. When I face trials... Sustain me and lead me out of the danger. And then finally, the prayer ends uh, for the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours forever and ever. Amen. Now, this part of the prayer is not in most modern translations of the Bible. And that, again, sometimes confuses people. But the reason is because it's not in the earliest Greek manuscripts of the book of Matthew. But it's in some of the manuscripts. And it's been said by Christians for many centuries. From the very earliest stages of the church, even from the first century, people were saying this prayer. So there's nothing wrong with saying it. Of course, it's a very appropriate way to end the prayer. For uh, the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours forever. We submit all things to God's glorious kingdom. We declare God is the true king. The so-called kingdoms of this world, uh, you know, they are here today and they are gone tomorrow. And they do not rule over us. Uh, we are in God's family and in God's kingdom and in God's hands. And we give him all the honor and power and glory. It's a very short prayer. But it's full of biblical truth. We've only scratched the surface today of all the depth of meaning behind this prayer. And our prayers don't need to be long. That's the other thing Jesus says in this passage. He says you don't need to go on and on as if the length of your prayer will make you be heard. It's not about how loud you pray. It's not about how long you pray. It's about the God you're praying to. He's the one who answers the prayers. It's about trusting in him and giving everything over to him. It's the perfect prayer. It's a prayer for all seasons. It's the prayer for any day. It's a prayer for every day. It's a prayer for every person. We can all say this prayer together. As I said, even if you are a brand new Christian, even if you are a child to the oldest and saintliest and holiness, holiest Christian, we can all say this. Every single phrase has great depth of meaning behind it. And no matter how many times I say this prayer, I feel like I'm still learning to pray this prayer. And it's different in different seasons of life, in different challenges. It meets every situation. So, if you don't know how to pray, 
pray this prayer. You can learn how to pray from Jesus by saying the Lord's Prayer and asking him to help you. When you don't know what to pray for, pray this prayer. It's a prayer from Jesus himself. How can you go wrong? And I think you'll find that whatever situation you're in, this prayer will cover it. Are you worried about the war in Ukraine? Your kingdom come. Are you sick? Your will be done. Deliver us from evil. Do you need help finding a job? Give us this day our daily bread. Are you burdened with guilt? Do you have a broken relationship with someone that you need to heal? Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. So prayer isn't always easy. It doesn't come easily to everyone, and that's okay. Because Jesus has made it easy for us to know how to pray. So my prayer for you is that you would all be strengthened in your own prayer life, as I am, by continuing to turn again and again to this perfect prayer, the Lord's Prayer. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Pether, for, um, yeah, just walking us through the Lord's Prayer and, um, yeah, just teaching us how to apply it in every situation, everything that we may go through. Um, yeah, let's all rise and sing the Lord's Prayer together. <clears throat> Father in heaven. Father in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Our Father in heaven, and lead us now. Temptation, God deliver us from the enemy. Yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory each moment all that we need forgive us our sins as we forgive the ones who have sinned against us oh our father in heaven lead us not and lead us not into temptation, but God deliver us from the enemy. Yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory. is the king. 
let's remain standing and pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. O oh Lord, we gather here. We're very thankful for your presence. And as we go into our separate ways, into our different circumstances, we know that you are our King and you are our Lord. So send us forth into our schools, into our workplaces, into our neighborhoods, into our families, into our circle of friends, that we can continue to serve you right there. For we know that you are with us, no matter where we are. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus, the love of the Heavenly Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forever. Amen. There is no time for offering, so if you would like to um, send your offering, you can do it through e-transfer, or there is a box at the door, and you can also send your offering throughout the week to the church office. Announcements for today, the in-person Christmas celebration is on Friday, December 23rd, 6.30, and it is $15, so please RSVP through the Google form, which is in the WhatsApp group. Yes, or you can contact Jonathan or Pastor Felix for more information. And also for those who are considering to receive baptism or confirmation or joining TCMC as a member, please contact any of the pastors to arrange um, for preparation classes. Those are all the announcements for today. These are the responsibilities for next week. And after a moment of silent prayer, service will be concluded. <laughs>